still. Why are you making us do another? You do know that's the one we'll crash on. Yeah, so you went off the track here, you're flying something like 30 meters, hitting the road under you, and then continuing rolling downwards the slope. And I say, I do remember saying to them, drag me by my arms, not my legs, because I think I've broken that leg. Um, it was the very last run of the day. We'd ended up at a hill climb in Switzerland, and I'd done I don't know, four, four, five runs, three, four runs. The last one of the day um, at the top, just over the finishing line, uh, it got away from me, and I went over the edge. Um, and over the finishing line, then there's a slight right and a left. And as I went around the left, back end stepped away. I think there's a little clip of video around that you can see. It sort of steps away, um, and then uh, over I went. I was very much aware at that point that it being a hill climb and me being at the end of it, I would be at the top of the hill. So what followed was getting down the hill very, very quickly. You've got the track of it, haven't you? Yeah. Where it actually went. So it hit the road. You first hit the road under the road where you left the track. So it's a lower road. Yeah. yeah. You hit that and then you continu continued rolling for another 100 meter or so. Have you got those pictures of? So the hill climb is 1.8 kilometers long with an altitude increase of uh, 157 meters from start to finish. And when you went off, that was beyond the finishing line. From the moment when you went off until the car stopped is a air distance of 110 meters, not taking into account uh, the altitude change. There's also three houses in the way. Yeah, so you didn't go straight. You kind of got around the house and How did it over get around that house? I guess because the slope is you yeah, know in this direction it around. was going more here and then yeah. because of the slope it went right after the house luckily because it's a wooden house so I was briefly away. a golf ball in your car. Yeah. yeah so you went off the track here you're flying something like 30 meters hitting the road under you and then continuing rolling downwards the slope so and you've got those shots of where it landed. I want to see those images of it. Yeah, so when you landed, um, so this is the shot. That's the journey. So it, from was, that, it appears to go through a house. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, you bended physics a little bit, so you didn't go straight. You went yeah. uh, in a curve. So, the, so that's just a crater. Yeah, one of the craters you left behind you, and there are many more as the car rolled down. Yeah, so that's what happened. So as you went over the, the cliffside, what, what went through your head? I mean, were you conscious throughout? Um, I was aware that I was up, that I was high, that inevitably the car was going to come down. Um, and yeah, of course, there was a, a moment of, of dread. Oh, God, I'm, I'm going to die. And also I was aware that the car was taking just such a beating. I mean, if you look at those craters, that's a big hole. Um, which was, that's just impact. And it looks like the thing's been dropped from space to leave a hole that big. So yeah, I, I was probably going through my mind was, well, this is it. Yeah. Basically, in fact, that is what was going through my mind. I thought, I'm, I'm, I've, I've had it. Because in the last big accident, in the Top Gear days, you weren't conscious of it, I suppose. Whereas here, you've actually got a chance to think. I was know. conscious of that one. I've got a history with this. <laughs> I was conscious of that one up to the point where it, where that car went over at 300 miles an hour. Um, and at that point, just before it dug in upside down, then I was unconscious. This one was conscious all the way through. And yeah, I was thinking, well, it can't, I can't make this. I mean, you're aware of tumbling sky grand, sky grand, sky grand, sky grand. Do you have any and idea how many times you rolled no, over? No. no, it could have been once, it could have been a dozen, honestly, I don't know. Um, and I think it was, it will have been in that, that I got injured. And, and look, there's, there's scratch there. <laughs> there's a bit of a scratch on my shin. But really, the, the, the main injury is this knee that I've, I've messed. Can you show us the scar? No, all I've got, my, my, my youngest daughter, when I came home and said that was it, she said, Daddy, you look like you've fallen over in the playground. Because <laughs> there's a big scar there and a, they put a big plate in there to hold. Basically what happened was that leg, I think I was braced against the bulkhead, probably bracing myself because the car was rolling. I mean, it's not relaxing. And at some point, one of the impacts, maybe when it left that huge crater, that transmitted through my shin into this knee and basically collapsed the knee joint on the bottom on the top of the bottom bone. So it pushed that down by seven mil. 
and I'm not a man who can afford to lose seven mil <laughs> in his legs. And his first question was, did you not ask him to put a bit more in? There's no point putting more on one leg. Because I just we, go around and say, right. I'm not breaking that one. <laughs> Have you got another car? <laughs> yeah, but well, I'm not giving well, to you. Well, there you go, you see. So how am I going to do that one? So yeah, that, that's when I said it was in that process of, of it was like being in a tumble dryer full of bricks going down a hill, obviously. Yeah. I was conscious it was upside down. And obviously your brain's telling you that's not a good place to be. Um, I mean, to be fair, I was also, I, I did feel at that point that was lucky because the battering it took to leave craters that big, it, it does speak to the structural integrity of the, the thing. The fact that when I set off, bearing in mind when it's on its wheels before it's been thrown down a mountain, even with me in it, with a helmet on, there's only about that much, it's a small car, it's not massive. So there's only about that much clearance, which means that's, if it had collapsed by more than that, that's my head, and it obviously hadn't. But obviously because it was upside down, I was hanging off the seat belt, resting my head on a crash arm, and it was difficult to get out. But the first thing, it, it, we've all done it, you, you want to get out. I was wriggling and writhing to get out, which is a bit difficult because, you know, I only had a normal seat belt on, not a harness, again, amazing considering. Um, I had to get my helmet off, which was difficult, drag myself out, by which point some people had arrived and I said, I do remember saying to them, drag me by my arms, not my legs, because I think I've broken that leg. They pulled me away a little bit. Yeah, especially for me, it was surprising seeing that the first thing that he hit was the second road, road under the one he uh, took off of. So, and then the car rolled God knows how many times more. We are still evaluating the data and all the footage, but um, yeah, the, the car hold up pretty well. Of course, the bad thing is that it caught fire. Um, you know, there are many supercars and electric cars that catch fire just by sitting there and considering what our car went through and catching fire, I think, you know, it's, it's understandable. Of course, we are not happy with that and we are improving the car and our batteries to not do that anymore and this data will help us a lot, this accident will help us to understand better what happened. But what nobody sees is when he went off that road, what happened after that. So there was a lot of rolling, a lot of distance and a lot of flying involved and a lot of hard impacts which led to uh, the fire um, which was still you know, not spreading that fast that he couldn't get out. So from that perspective I'm happy but of course we want to prevent some things like this happening in the future. So what you're basically saying is you had the ultimate crash test dummy. Yeah, but he didn't deliver enough data, unfortunately. Yeah, come on. <laughs> he has actually been asking me for data. <laughs> You're really critical. How many times did you roll? I don't know. I didn't count. <laughs> There's the hundreds of people going up. So we were queuing to go back down, James and I in our cars, him behind me. Then the radio crackles into life and Phil, the director, says, oh, chaps, um, that was really good. Yeah, no, we're on our way back. Mm, can I get one more run out of you? We kicked off like a couple of petulant schoolboys because we, as far as we were concerned, we've done it. And laid into Phil saying, and I regret it. Oh, Phil, why are you making us do another? You do know that's the one we'll crash on. And in fact, I passed him on the start line before I went up to get to the bottom of the hill and just I was pulling up to the start line. I said to Phil, oh, Phil, you make me do this. You know this is the one I'm going to crash on. And then a minute later, I feel so bad. That's about the meanest thing I've ever done to another human being. It was a total accident. It was, I, I mean, it obviously didn't mean to, but I mean, he did turn up at the hospital to his credit and uh, he looked properly shaken. Um, so he owes me a bit of a kick on the shins for that one. I think. It's always the last one. Yeah, well, well, yeah, but it is by definition. To be fair, that, that's exactly what happened the last time. Oh, so where were Jeremy and James in all this? I think I read in the papers that James was screaming and, and Jeremy had kind of wobbly legs, which is a... Bit of a weird concept. Yes, yeah, so James and I had gone up together. That was the point of that rambling story. So it was our last run of the day. Phil asked for another one. We did it. I got to the top and crashed. James, of course, was following up doing his run and arrived. And so both him and Jeremy saw it from different angles. They saw a car roll, 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 bounce, 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 bounce. Uh, and they thought, well, Ammon's had it. And then, of course, they saw them dragging a body, me, by my arms across the grass. And both thought, the other little fellas bought the farm. They claim to have been upset. Mm, really? 
Now, those of us who've spent a long time in the in the car world know that starting a new company is a huge challenge without some numpty celebrity throwing it off the side of the hill. Hello. Where do you go from here? For us, you know, this is obviously really important. Uh, the car, I think, has done well. We believe that it has proven that it's safe. Unfortunately, uh, Richard had to prove that. <laughs> no worries, mate. And as I understand it, this was very much the, the end of the shoot, Richard. So you'd, you'd had plenty of time to, to experience the car. What, what did you make of it? it had, I'd, I'm not just saying this because you're here and you'll kick my bag leg. <laughs> um, I loved it. I mean, you know, that it, was, it is astonishing. It's the first all-electric supercar I've been in. And, and it, that, that has proper ambitions in terms of range, which is always the first question people ask, but also performance. It's what, 1,200 horsepower they're going yeah. off. Uh, four motors, one for each wheel, so in terms of torque vectoring, it can every several times a second. Isn't 100 it? times per second. There you go. Be interrogating what's happening at each wheel and distributing power accordingly. Um, it was breathtaking and it felt genuinely futuristic and modern. Another interesting thing, and I don't want to, I just don't want to give too much away because we, you know, made the film about it, but things like the noises it made, because it does. And it, for all of us, that is to you as well as a, a, a journalist, we are going to have to invent a whole new vocabulary, a whole new lexicon for the sounds that these things make. Because that, the, remote, the concept one, makes some distinctive noises at different phases and stages. I don't yet know whether, is that a good noise? Or is it a really bad noise? I don't know. Um, but there's all sorts of buzzes and whirs and whines and ticks and different sounds going through it. We have to learn how to describe and what they signify. This is an electric car built by Petrohertz, you know? Mm. It's not by somebody who wants to get rid of cars or by somebody who thinks that walking is the better way of transport. Uh, we genuinely like cars. We, are, we were Petrohertz. So we, for example, the prototypes had electric power strings, but we really didn't like it. So the production cars have hydraulic ones. The Which one was a good call. Yeah, so. It does feel better. You know, it's, uh, it is electric, but we were trying to use the advantages that electric power trains give to not just make an electric sports car, but actually make the sports car better. Yeah. And that's what we wanted to achieve, for example, with the four motors and the torque vectoring to bring it to the next level, not just make it electric. I mean, the whole idea was to show that electric cars can be not just efficient and you know environmentally friendly and so on, but I really believed that the electric motor is the perfect machine to power anything, especially a sports car. So I was wondering back then when I started to convert my gas-powered E30 BMW that was four years older than myself. That's how I started to build electric cars. I wanted to prove that electric cars can be also fast and fun and, you know, that enthusiasts don't have to worry about the future, that they can also have fun with electric cars. So the concept one is basically the embodiment of that. It shows uh, in one product what electric cars can do. Four motors, two-speed double-clutch gearbox on each side in the rear, uh, four acceleration and top speed so you don't you know, electric cars are usually one trick pony. They can accelerate fast, but then lose breath soon after that. We paid a lot of attention to thermal management so that you can do really a lot of laps on the racetrack without overheating. You have decent range when you don't drive too fast. When you drive fast, that you still have enough range for a few laps on the, on the track. You can recharge it very fast, like you have done in Switzerland with the fast charging stations. So it basically shows what electric cars can do. We came out of Croatia where there was never a car industry, so we couldn't hire somebody who has done this before. We had to come up with everything ourselves. We couldn't afford to pay suppliers to do stuff for us. So we had to learn by doing, by making mistakes. So it took some time until we you know, came up with a car that was on the level where we are happy with. And we have learned a lot along the way. When we designed the first concept one, we were just six people. Now we are 250 people in the company and worked for the whole industry basically. But the whole point of that car is to show what we as a company can do because we are basically a technology company helping other companies to build interesting products and electrified, connected, smart vehicles. So our bits and pieces are in many other uh, vehicles, not just in hypercars, but also now trickling down to more mass produced cars, to premium and sports vehicles and so on. Um, so for us, it's really important to show with the car what we can do. But the real business for us is applying that technology to various different uh, cars and, and applications. So how many times in your life can you really get some genuinely new uh, experience? If you look at, a, let's say, a Lamborghini and a Ferrari, of course they are different, but how much different? Maybe, you know, 5%? Can we put a number on that? Like mid-engined, you know, V12 or V8 turbo and stuff like that. 
Here we make an electric car, fully electric, with four motors, uh, with four gearboxes, with two double clutch, uh, two speed gearboxes in the rear, with torque vectoring that you can adjust to have front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, all wheel drive, or anything in between, where you can customize the driving experience exactly like you want with the push of a button and millions of other things that the electric powertrain gives you as uh, opportunities. And that's something genuinely new. Of course, some people would never buy a gas-powered uh, supercar. Some people would never buy an electric supercar. Um, and there are people that are new in the market because this is the first electric supercar you can buy. But also there are many people that already have everything else and want something truly new and want to be part of this new movement of, you know, reinventing the car basically because right now the whole industry is going through a big change and we are part of that change not just with our car but that ends up in a lot of different uh, products so we are very thankful for our customers because yes it's an expensive car it's very few of them but that's how you develop technology which then can come up into higher volumes and you know into more consumer based products and if people didn't know who and what the company were before i guess they they do now. So what's what's next for you? My PR campaign, I've run for you very successfully. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so first of all, I think uh, I can't wait for the show to get out that you see how our car, how an electric supercar compares in, in the real world, in the Alps, on racetracks and so on, whatever the guys have done, compared to the, let's say, top of the line, other conventional supercars. And for us as a company, um, the concept one is sold out. We have a new model coming that will be produced in higher volume on a completely different level. It will be even crazier, even more performance. Uh, it's a global car, so for global certification, US homologation, EU homologation and so on. But the really big step for the company is getting from this 200 people uh, technology and R&D and low volume company into a big supplier for the car industry. So yes, we are going to make our own supercars, but the real business without which our company would never be able to survive is delivering this technology to other car manufacturers. And that's really the big step for where we are right now to get from 250 people to 1,000 people and get into mass production. Obviously that was, if not my first thought, my first thought was to phone my wife and tell her I'd crashed whilst the air ambulance was landing to take me away because I needed her to know I hadn't done my noggin again. My next thought, pretty much, was, uh, yeah, what are we gonna do? Do you know where it's, timed out if it was going to happen and God, I, mean, I wish it hadn't for me and I wish it hadn't for you because I was about to say there were only eight of those cars, there's only seven now I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, makes it more rare. And it was a customer's car wasn't it? Yeah, and the customer's alright, don't worry. Customer's car. So what are you going to do? Are you going to build another car? Uh, we said we'll build eight so one less. So it's now even more exclusive. <laughs> yeah, the remaining owners will be very happy. Yeah, <laughs> you've increased the value. Well, that's it's just a service I provide. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, we'd far rather it hadn't happened. But if it was going to happen, it's just worked out perfectly. Um, because obviously, we don't film in the order necessarily that things go out, um, and we've been busy. For once, if anything, we're a little bit ahead with our homework, or we're certainly on time with it, because we're usually not. Really not. Um, so what we've got left to shoot, I can I can do what I have to do. We can, we can make it. The, 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 the short answer is we can, without changing any of the films we'd planned, without adjusting anything of the show of this series. We can we can complete it. Yeah. Also worth saying is this happened on day five, like yes. you were driving the car. Oh yeah, we made that film is made. <laughs> I'd injure myself in the kitchen. No, and the reason for that is we do exciting, difficult, sometimes dangerous stuff all the time. We are absolutely not gung-ho or frivolous or thoughtless about it, otherwise we wouldn't, wouldn't survive one series. It's what we do, it's part of the show. We don't, we're not adrenaline junkies, we're in our 40s and 50s in their case. Uh, but it needs the thrills in it, but we evaluate everything we're doing. We take every precaution, and we are also accepting of the fact that sometimes accidents happen. I've, I've had that two or three times in my life. It's an accident, and you can break it down and break it down and break it down and break it down, and 
ultimately it's an accident and it's happened. As long as once it's happened, you then mitigate it against it getting worse. So for instance, somebody's got, we've got to know there's medics on site. There were, there's an air ambulance there within minutes. Our crew always, we carry, you know, if, we, if we're not at a, a controlled event where they're providing the cover, we have a call sheet on which will be details of the nearest hospital, details of who to call. All of that is covered. We don't want it to go wrong. But if it does go wrong, we've done everything we can to make sure it's not as bad, not the worst outcome. So no, it won't, it won't, it won't change any of that. I'm asked that a lot anyway, since my crash of 10 years ago. Um, no, because I wouldn't be doing it if I thought it was going to kill me. But equally, you could walk out of here now and slip in the car park. One of, one of the guys working here, young Tom, very fit, sporty young man, decides to take up basketball on his first game. Leapt in the air, landed, massive spiral fracture, hurt ligaments off, leg ruined. You know, what's he going to do? You did Not it in fashion, at least. Hmm? You did it in fashion, Yeah, I did it in style. Yeah. I did it in style. I haven't yet seen him. I've yeah. given him some grief. In an electric supercar. Exactly. It's more like... <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, we're not going to... It won't... Um, it won't stop us being gung ho because we never have been and we're not. I know that sounds boring. Truth of it is, we're we're all grown ups. A lot of us with families, all of us with careers. We don't want to crock ourselves. I mean, what we were there doing, because I haven't explained what we were in Switzerland for. Um, we were. It was a film where we'd got three supercars, really. One of which was old school. Lambo, or petrol. One was the new NSX hybrid. One was the Rimac Concept One, all electric. So it's past, present, and future, which is a rather neat. And then we we took them to, to to Switzerland, the three of us, and we were having lots of adventures and japes and trips and 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 different ways of testing them. The final one of which was the hill climb event. So it was the very very last thing we had shot. Everything. It was all in the can. It was all done. I perhaps push things a bit. I'm naturally a fairly bouncy individual of the three of us. Um, but comparing us really is like, you know, comparing a, an orangutan, a panda and a shrew. We're not really immediately comparable, are we? So I don't know. I don't know. But sometimes it's because, you know, I, I, I was thrown off a horse, but that's because I saw that one was a bit more lively. And I said to those, don't worry, chaps, I can ride a horse. And then I can. Um, sometimes it's just bad luck. It was I did I did read on the internet some there was a Swiss um, uh, hill climber who'd said yeah a professional wouldn't have done it I didn't want to read that from him a professional wouldn't have done it really no racing drivers ever crashed are you sure actually so the, what the car is doing with the torque vectoring you want you tell the car where you want to go so this is your input to the system and the system does everything to point the car where you want to go so when you went into that left hand corner you were way too fast and you, you would turn the steering wheel more than the car can take, more than physics can take with the, um, with the, um, uh, with the tires and uh, the weight of the car and so on. So what the system did actually was to, to yaw the car around where you want to have it. So in order to do that, it had to, uh, to get the back end of the car around. It was no other way, otherwise you would just have went straight. There was not enough time. You wanted to turn the car on the spot, you know. There was not enough asphalt to turn the car where you wanted to have it. So I think that the car did exactly what you asked it for. You were just too fast. I mean, that resonates with me because on the little video clip, it, it clearly goes into oversteer. But the only thing I would say is the previous day when we'd been doing the drag race and they were messing about on a little, found a little bit of time, I had to drive around pretty hard. I could not, for the life of me, provoke oversteer. Yeah. I could, oh, it would only understeer. I mean, I damn near understeer, understeer over a cameraman. But it would not, I could not get, no matter how much, I mean, the thing generates a lot of grip, but there's always a limit to mechanical grip. And I was throwing it around this sort of fairly gentle but constant radius bend at ever increasing speeds, trying to get it into oversteer, and it wouldn't. That's the job it. of the torque vector. why did it suddenly do it? You were doing four runs before, so the first run, the top speed was 145 kilometers per hour, and you went faster and faster every time, so that the last run you did with, or the last before the crash, you did uh, with 177 kilometers per hour, which is about 110 miles per hour. 
before um, the braking zone of that corner. So that was quite a lot of speed. And the first corner uh, after the finish line, the first time you went, you took it with 108 kilometers per hour. The last time you took it with 134 kilometers per hour. So you got faster and faster every time you pushed the limits and wanted to get faster. So, you know, I just think uh, very simply, you got more and more confidence in the car. And in the end, a little bit too it much sounds confidence. sounds like a team boss, <laughs> <laughs> blaming the driver. You were running out of road, you were going too fast. So you wanted to get through the corner anyways. Oh, and I, I, I over input, I put more turning, I wanted so some left. What the car but basically... the previous day, if I'd done that, it would have just understeered. Uh, I w so you, you probably didn't naturally turn the steering wheel so much. So what happened there, in my opinion, is... So this is your input through... You yeah. have two inputs. You have the steering and the brake and throttle pedal. So yeah. this is what you tell the car, this is where I want to go and this is what I want you to do. So when you do this to the car, it says, okay, you want me to go there. But if there is not enough road, it will rotate the car more than the tires can handle. So this is basically what happened. It rotated it too fast. But anyways, this just meant that you went off sideways. If it didn't do that, you would just have gone straight maybe because where you try to do it is a just one direction right it's just going yeah. left all the time what you did here on the uh, hill climb was you had there is a right, right left so yeah right left so maybe you provoked it, it too much scandinavian flick i mean it was, it was fairly yeah under braking yeah look i crashed that the, the, the that's what happened crashed <laughs>